Uh, our next speaker works with the citizen science project CosmoQuest, and I'm pretty sure she is a wizard because she made a comment earlier. Did any of you see this? Wizardry. Oh, Wizardry. <laughs> wizard, you're a wizard, Nicole. Okay, so without further ado, Dr. Nicole Guliucci. <laughs> Guliucci. Oh, damn it. Here you go. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I would tell people you have to do the hand thing when you do Gallucci. I, I actually grew up in New York, but um, I have been told by real Italians that I pronounce it wrong when I say Gallucci, but what are you gonna do? So hi, everybody, I'm Nicole. Uh, I do work with CosmoQuest Citizen Science. I am a postdoc at uh, Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, so we're in the St. Louis area, just on the other side of the state here. Um, and I wanted to talk about ways that people can do science and get involved in science research um, wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever your background. It's become uh, easier and easier to actually be involved in science through citizen science. Um, and, and the way, actually, science and skepticism were were, um, ended up becoming intertwined for me. I was, uh, I was always interested in science, um, but I came from a religious background and it wasn't until later where I was like, I'm very skeptical of all of this. Um, but I discovered that the, the people who identified, self-identified as skeptics and atheists often had this leaning towards uh, enjoying science, in, in a way being fans of science. Um, um, in this interplay, uh, both philosophically, it, it, you need a healthy skepticism in order to do science and be a scientist. Um, at the very least, there, there's an overlap, so there's an overlap in these communities, and we might call these fans of science also lifelong learners. So all of you here in the audience, you're here listening to talks, you're learning, you're um, continuing that process that honestly a lot of people stop doing uh, once they leave school. So either way, I thought it'd be really cool to come and give a little bit of a talk about science and ways that you can do science too. Um, and because the people that I've met through skepticism and atheism do appreciate science so much, even if that's not in their background or part of their career or part of their daily job, um, I see people trying to or, or doing, applying scientific principles to every parts of their life. And so in order to, if you're embracing science, using that in your life, using that skepticism for all of these aspects of your life. Why don't you just do some science research too? You actually can do it. Now, the idea of what is a scientist or who a scientist is, um, it depends on who you are, what you think a scientist looks like. Obviously, the stereotypical image, if you Google, uh, if you do a Google image search on, on scientists, you get you know, fairly stereotypical, uh, dude with crazy hair and a lab coat. He may be a mad scientist. Uh, there's a token woman there uh, with test tubes. We always have test tubes and, and lab coats, and it's, it's very sterile. Uh, some of them are wearing masks. Um, but uh, the words, uh, and many of you here may know lots of people who are in science, who are scientists, science communicators, uh, and know that we're not all, you know, dudes with crazy hair and lab coats. Um, in fact, just the other day, I kind of had this surprised uh, mom at a family science event, like, you're a what? You're, you're, you're a doctor? You, have, you do astronomy? And I have, like, the pink hair, and I look like the high school kids that I'm teaching. So, you know, so some of us like breaking the mold, and that's really cool. Um, having someone as a professional scientist, what it means to be a scientist, is something that was really only defined fairly recently. So in um, about the 1830s, 1840s, by an English philosopher and historian of science, uh, came up with the word scientist as someone who does science professionally. Um, and it was uh, kind of an analogy to the word artist. An artist is someone who does art, so a scientist must be someone who does science. Before that, um, so that was the moment at which science really became a profession. Um, you uh, have, uh, like I said, you have a, people's idea of a scientist could be uh, the guy in the lab coat, uh, could be the, you know, the characters on Big Bang Theory, if you watch that, it could be, you know, pink haired girl like me. 
Um, but a scientist wasn't always a profession. It wasn't always a lifelong calling. It wasn't always a job. Uh, most of the greats of science that we know of, um, a lot of our science history was done by people who did not have the uh, title of scientist. Uh, we had the, the natural philosophers of old. We had uh, people who were um, wealthy and did this on the side or were under the employ of royalty, uh, for example. Um, people like uh, Newton, people like Thomas Jefferson, who did a lot of science on the side as a citizen. Uh, all the Herschels, especially Carolyn Herschel, who's, uh, of course, one of my favorites, especially because she gets passed over so often in favor of William Herschel. Uh, Mary Anning, who was uh, a fossil collector. These were all citizens who happened to do science, who, who uh, made great strides in our understanding of physics and biology, uh, but they weren't technically, at the time at least, professionals. They were citizen scientists. So the idea of a citizen scientist, a person who does science but not as their job and not for a living, uh, was actually the norm. Some of my, uh, and that's continued, that continued even after science became an actual uh, profession. Um, so we have uh, different organizations. There, A um, lot of bird watching uh, has been done by citizen scientists. It takes people who are in their communities, out in the field, out um, making observations. Um, the AAVSO is the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Um, variable stars need to be cataloged and watched over long periods of time while they're variable. Guess what you can't do is uh, success, it's really hard to successfully propose for lots and lots of time on a big telescope. Uh, and a lot of these stars you don't need a big telescope for, so amateur astronomers, people who do this in their spare time, have cataloged variable stars. My favorite citizen scientist is the guy on the right. Uh, that is Grote Reber. Um, my background is, uh, my, my PhD is actually in astronomy, although now I'm doing a lot more in science education. Um, I, I was a radio astronomer. I built radio telescopes. Uh, if your picture of a radio telescope might be a big dish in the middle of the desert or a Y-shaped array of dishes in the desert, I actually got to work there um, for a couple of summers. And radio astronomy was discovered not by astronomers, um, but by an engineer by the name of Carl Jansky in the 1930s. He was uh, looking for sources of static on intercontinental phone lines, and he discovered uh, there was a one particular signal that came from lightning, and there was another particular signal that came from lightning but further away, and then there was this other signal that had this weird period that wasn't 24, quite 24 hours. It had the same period as the stars. Oh, the galaxy's giving off radio waves. That's weird. <laughs> so he published that, and uh, most astronomers didn't notice, and it kind of uh, lay fallow for a while, until this gentleman here, Grote Reber, he uh, was an engineer in Wheaton, Illinois, and he uh, was a ham radio operator, and he had, you know, collected all the little badges and things. I, I've never done ham radio, sadly. Um, but all the little things, the milestones that you can collect being a ham radio operator, he'd talk to everybody all over the world. He's like, what do I do next? Um, oh, there's these radio waves from space. Let's see if I can do that. And he built a big, he built the first dish radio, uh, radio dish, uh, radio telescope in uh, like a field across the street from his mom's house in his spare time while he worked all day as an engineer and then did this at night. Just a guy in his spare time mapped the friggin' galaxy for the very first time. So he is my favorite, favorite citizen, citizen scientist. Uh, he, in fact, continued to contribute to radio astronomy uh, through, throughout the rest of his life. So citizen scientists do make an impact, even though we're in a state now where, well, as, as one of my, um, as Don Backer, late Don Backer, um, one of my uh, colleagues in grad school, my advisors, used to say, if it was easy, it would have been done already. <laughs> All the, the lower hanging science fruit has been picked. Um, you, we are moving towards bigger and bigger equipment, bigger telescopes, big projects to delve further into what makes up the universe. Um, and so that makes it harder for, in one sense, it makes it harder for people to get involved in science um, because it's this big institutional thing. But in another sense, as I'm gonna show you, 
there are lots of ways in which um, people can contribute to science uh, through citizen science. So citizen science is a term I've been using a little bit up here. It's a term you might have already heard of. Um, and it actually made its way into the Oxford English Dictionary uh, just this year in June. Uh, the term citizen science is a collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. So that is a way in which anybody can be involved in collecting and analyzing data. And there are, um, as it turns out, there is a plethora of citizen science projects that you could uh, take part in. Of course, if you come to our table the rest of this weekend, we have a table for our project, which I'll tell you a little bit about. We want you to do ours, but there are actually lots and lots of projects out there that you can do, that you can do with your kids, that you can do if you're a teacher with your students, um, and actually get involved in the process. Um, so where do you even start? Uh, and there are a couple good places to start. Uh, some of my favorites, um, there is a, uh, a blog called Coop's Citizen Size Scoop. Uh, Karen Cooper does a weekly roundup or semi-weekly roundup of interesting citizen science projects and news from citizen science projects, including the results that come from citizen science projects so that you can see, yes, this project or that project's actually publishing papers and scientific journals with people's contributions. Um, and then another website called SciStarter. It's a great way to find citizen science projects because you can pick by topic. Say, I want to do astronomy or I want to do botany. You can pick whatever science you find interesting or based on where you are. You can pick an outdoor project. You can pick an indoor project. You can pick one you do at museums, one to do with your kids. They have lots of teaching materials. Um, so SciStarter is one really good place to start if you're saying to yourself, I want to do citizen science. Where, where do I go to find projects? Who's going to let me do work with them? Um, and some examples that uh, I've talked about in the past um, on, on our blog, um, one of them is called Coco Raz. Don't ask me what the acronym stands for. I don't know. It's a combination of uppercase and lowercase letters. Um, they're almost as bad as astronomers. Um, but it is, it is a citizen science project. Um, oh wait, I do have it down. Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. Uh, it's a way of making, basically taking weather data, weather measurements from all over the world. Instead of you know, a few scientists trying to set up all of these stations, they're engaging people by having them set up their own weather stations and collect data on rainfall, on snowfall, on, on all of that. Um, it's a nonprofit community-based network of volunteers, all ages, um, who then report back to the project on what's going on in their area, what's going on in their community. Uh, one that I think is particularly adorable is the Lost Ladybug Project. And that one, they um, particularly try and get teachers involved in that one. Um, so scientists want uh, to find and photograph uh, ladybugs. Um, and this is a really great one to get kids involved, um, to see where they are, where they're becoming rare, how they can be protected. Um, and then Project Budburst is another fairly successful project, um, which is great because it, it helps scientists understand climate change by tracking the time that, um, the timing of plants flowering or fruiting or shooting leaf, leaf shoots, I'm not a biologist, um, when all this happens and the change in that over time, and again, it's individuals collecting data, where they live, where they are, being able to report that back and make that part of the whole body of science, which is really, really fantastic. Um, so Project Budburst, um, and particularly like this because it connects to climate change, and as Cairo was just saying, uh, we have uh, members of, of Congress with important roles to play in deciding science funding who don't believe in climate change. Well, we have citizen science projects where regular everyday people are making measurements that are contributing to our understanding of climate change. Like, you can really get in on the ground floor of, of where this climate change research is happening. Uh, there's another one that I don't remember the name of, but I came across it at a conference. Uh, they were 
people with, I think it was maple trees, like they were getting the syrup from maple syrup, um, and they had logs of observations that went back 100 years, and they were going through these logs and continuing to take data to see uh, how climate change was affecting these trees. And these were people who were in a particular area of the country or were a particular community. They, you wouldn't necessarily find a lot of people who were gung-ho about, let's do something about climate change until they were part of the citizen science project and they could see that these hundred, you know, these decades of data. A couple um, of projects that I have, uh, there, there, I, I, there's one project, in addition to the project that I work for, um, there is one project that I've participated in and it's called Project Mercury. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this one. This one is, um, it uh, comes out of the Science Starter website and uh, Science Cheerleader and they are collecting microbes from people around the world. And so I actually took part in that at a conference. Um, they will collect a swab from your shoe and from your cell phone uh, and grow these in labs to see uh, what it's like for, what the, the microbiome is like for people in different parts of the country, different parts of, I think it's just in the country, might be in the world. Um, as another project that they did is they collected samples, since they're the science cheerleaders, they collected sample, they had, um, they took people from the crowd at, sp at sports games, at football and basketball, like NBA and NFL games, and took them to center court or the 50 yard line and took swabs from all of these stadiums and arenas. And they have this little like Super Bowl matchup sports thingy. And <laughs> they have the microbes competing and like, oh my God, you're getting sports fans interested in science. That's so cool. Um, my family, there's a st strict divide along those lines. Some people have religious divides. We have sports and science. Um, so uh, they were doing that and they also have a um, project where they have, uh, they've taken these different samples and they've split them. Half of them are staying on Earth in the laboratory and the other half are going to the International Space Station, which is pictured in their patch there. Um, so they have these, these uh, you know, these Super Bowl matchups on Earth and then they have them in space and then they get to see which ones are going to do better in space and on Earth and so we were really excited to see that rocket go off. Um, and the, the, um, the orange looking sample over there is uh, actually a new species that was discovered uh, by some of these citizen scientists um, from the, oh, gosh, it was collected by the Pop Warner Colorado Cheerleader, it was like a high school cheerleader group um, that discovered a new species of bacteria, some kind of microbe uh, from a stadium seat. So <laughs> <laughs> check under your seats, people, you all get microbes. <laughs> So anyway, so I like microbes because they're gross and fantastic, even though I didn't actually study biology professionally. Um, and so I was really happy to actually you know, do my little swab for that project. Um, the project that I work for now is called CosmoQuest. Uh, so we have a table. You can see us out there and come talk to us. Basically, what we have going on is we have a website. So there's no touching of microbes or collecting of ladybugs. Um, it's all online. It's very clean and sterile. And uh, we get data from different NASA spacecraft. So from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is taking really high resolution pictures of the entire moon surface. Um, from um, the Dawn spacecraft, which uh, spent about a year orbiting Vesta. And uh, from the Messenger spacecraft, which is still in orbit around Mercury. In fact, it's dipped down to one of its lowest orbits, um, taking some incredible pictures before they wrap up the mission. So we have these these uh, images of these alien worlds, um, these really high resolution images, and we need to analyze all that data and see where all of the craters are and measure their sizes and look at the surface features to tell us something about the history of these worlds. We're learning more and more. Even the moon, which is like right next door, you know, it's talking about space here, it's right next door. Uh, we're still learning new things about it. We're learning that there's volatiles like water on the moon. Uh, we're learning a little bit about its, its very tenuous exosphere, which is like a very, very tenuous atmosphere. Um, so we're still uncovering those secrets. Um, we have so much data and so many images, and they all need to be looked at by a human. And, and we get asked all the time, why don't you program a computer to do it? Well, we've tried. <laughs> the computer, still not very smart. Um, we, we say once we get, once we get a, a, a robot, once we, uh, our programmer gets a robot going that can find all the craters, you know, Skynet's here and we're done. 
but we have these images that still need to be done by hand because our pattern matching eye brain thing we have going on is still a lot better than uh, the algorithms that they've tried to make to find these craters in all of these weird lighting situations and all of these you know, different angles. Um, people still do a lot better. Here's the problem, there's a lot of images and a lot of craters. Uh, Stuart, Stuart Robbins is one of the, um, he has the pseudo-astronomy blog and podcast. He um, is also the PI of our uh, Moon and Mercury project for his PhD thesis. So I complain about my dissertation. I had to go out in the desert and build these telescope things and unravel cable. He had to mark craters. He had to mark three million craters on Mars. He actually, uh, and he was doing it with like a stylus and a touchpad type of thing, and he actually has a, a permanent callus on one of his fingers for marking all of these craters for his PhD. So he like literally suffered for his degree. Um, so he was so grateful when the opportunity came around to do citizen science and have people help. So instead of one person marking three million craters, each of you can do a little bit and do a little bit of marking um, of these craters and measurement and um, actually help us understand these worlds. Uh, what we're really excited about is that uh, we're, we've been getting some really good results from this. And I can show you a picture. I'm not sure quite how illustrative it will be. This is a sample of a picture, uh, sorry, a part of, I think this is near the Apollo 15 landing site, I think. Um, this is a section of the moon that we had marked uh, Stuart Pitt eight crater experts with, from grad student to person who's been in the field for many decades uh, against each other with their own tools and their own methods of crater counting to see how they did. And it turned out there's quite a big spread in how they mark craters. They, everybody does it just a little bit differently, um, probably with more of a, an error than people realized for decades. Um, but what we did find is that the average of the experts, those eight people, um, matched up with the average of our volunteers. So the top is the experts, the bottom is the volunteers. Uh, you have to do a little bit of filtering for somewhere people get the shadows wrong, but when you average together um, the work of all of our citizen scientists, all of our volunteers, they get results that are just as good as the experts. It gets rid of that individual bias problem, and it gets it done a lot faster. And it's also a way of reaching out to people and saying, hey, you can be part of this scientific process too. You're actually doing research with NASA data that's gonna go into a journal and get published. Uh, and I, again, I did this family science thing um, a few, day, few nights ago and I'm saying, hey, is this now you're helping NASA scientists and the parents were like, did you hear that? You're helping NASA. And the kid's are like, okay, Ma, I heard her, I heard her. Like, You're helping NASA. It's like, hey, that, you know, when you say NASA, people listen. Um, so we're doing that science and we're exploring these worlds and we're asking everybody to help out. And that's been really fantastic because um, you've been helping out with the moon, you've been helping out with asteroid Vesta, the first and only asteroid we've, ma we've mapped so completely, uh, and, and the planet Mercury as well. Uh, one of the things with the explosion, really, of these citizen science projects is a lot of people in the science education research community are asking, who are these citizen scientists? Who are these people? Um, who, who will spend their time doing this kind of work with us? Um, and all of us can talk anecdotally about the people who do citizen science with us. Um, you have lots of people who work on it a little bit, and you've got those few people who work on it a lot, uh, or who uh, you actually get to meet up with when you go to conferences and stuff like that. Uh, so for example, a bunch of our team, um, we do a lot of uh, outreach at sci-fi conventions, because it uh, turns out, well, we are sci-fi and fantasy geeks, but we, <laughs> we find that uh, our fellow sci-fi and fantasy geeks are, are really amenable to listening to about science and space and NASA. Um, so we show up at these conventions and we actually have, uh, so there's a bunch of us team members uh, and uh, Nancy and Paul who are two of our volunteers who've been mapping with us and doing citizen science. Actually more Nancy, I think, I think she's brought her husband along for the ride. Um, so she, she's the science person. Um, and we get to meet these people and spend time with these people and uh, see why they're interested in science. Um, we're, more rigorously undertaking a research project um, where we've been surveying and interviewing people. And, and I, I 
did the first round of interviews and it was so cool to hear people talk about why they want to spend time in front of a computer marking craters for somebody else's research project. Um, I remember when Galaxy Zoo from, uh, first came out, uh, everyone was like, yeah, this is so cool, you can help find the shape of galaxies and do research. And we had just done a homework assignment on that in grad school and we all hated it. And <laughs> we're like, people are doing this for fun? What? You know, because when you have to do it, it gets a little bit old. Um, so why, why are people doing this? And just the kind of reasons that we're, again, I'm speaking anecdotally because we're not finished um, with the analysis of the interviews just yet. But the feeling of pride that a lot of our volunteers have saying, I did this, I helped science. Uh, the feeling of, yeah, I know science funding kind of sucks right now, so if we can help, that's awesome. Uh, some people just like space, they like looking at pretty pictures. Um, so all the reasons that we're getting are pretty interesting. Um, I do want to show off our youngest citizen scientist. He's five years old and his dad sent us this picture. So it's, it's, an, it's an easy enough interface that you, know, you can spend some time with your kids to, to get them going. Um, personally, I find that uh, kids within a certain age range, these young kids are picking it up really fast because they've grown up with these you know, tablets mice and everything, and they, they really know what they're doing. Um, they pick it up pretty quickly, sometimes a lot more quickly than I ever would have. So you can, this is something you can do with your kids, with your students, depending on the level uh, of project that it is. So we're finding out who our citizen scientists are. We're finding out what, what motivates them. Um, we want to know who these people are, but also how we can help citizen scientists well, figure out why they're doing it and see if we can give them more of what they want and see if we can give people more um, things that will continue to satisfy them to keep engaging in science. And then how to effectively harness this amazing power of all of these people working together to, to uh, crowdsource, crowdsource a scientific research problem. It's so fascinating. Um, so from one of, the, one, of the, one of my favorite papers I've read about this, um, talks about some of the various reasons. Uh, volunteers participate in scientific activities out of interest, curiosity, uh, commitment to conservation. That's not necessarily a case on the moon, but for a lot of these uh, in environmental projects, commitment to, to conservation um, and, and educational efforts. We have quite a few people at CosmoQuest who are here because they wanted a cool classroom activity that they could do with their students. Um, but motivations are temporal, uh, they're dynamic, and even if they're working on the same project, and even if the scientific goal is the same, people's motivations change from when they start a project to when to why they continue to work on a project. A lot of people will start a project because it's fun and new and exciting, and I saw it on TV, uh, and that's awesome. Uh, and some people stick around and some don't. And those that stick around uh, have kind of different motivations. Um, they Again, they feel like maybe like they, yeah, they're a part of something important. They're a part of this community. Um, and that's something we try so hard to do uh, with CosmoQuest is to really kind of make it a community. Like, we're sharing this, we're doing this together. So why citizen science, I, I said, was kind of been around for, you know, all a long time before scientist as a profession came to be. Um, so why is citizen science such a big thing right now? Um, there's the practical reason, and I can speak from my own field of astronomy. Um, we have a lot of data. We are building bigger and bigger telescopes and keeping them on all the darn time and scanning the sky more and more. So the top example is the uh, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It is, it is a telescope that's currently being planned. It's uh, one, of the, one of the top priorities for U.S. astronomy uh, as far as, as uh, funding and research is concerned. Um, and this telescope will survey the sky, every, the entire sky every few nights. I don't know if you've realized this, the sky is really big. <laughs> the sky is really big when your field of view is like a tiny, tiny pinprick. Most of our telescopes can see really far, really detailed, really gorgeous things far away, but they can only see this tiny little, tiny, tiny spot. Seeing the whole sky that way is really difficult. Um, and it's only becoming um, a little bit easier um, with these new technologies uh, for, for scanning the sky. And so LSST is just going to have terabytes and terabytes of data and images raining down upon us. Um, and like I said before, there are some problems. 
that uh, computers just can't do. There's a lot we're going to script to do automatically, and then there's a lot that can't be done that, that way. Uh, in my own field of radio astronomy, uh, both of these are, of course, still artist conception-y type things because they're not built yet. Uh, the SKA, or the Square Kilometer Array, a telescope so big it's got to be put on two continents. Uh, it's, part of it's going to be built in South Africa. It's part of it's going to be built in Western Australia. Uh, and I had the, the, the privilege and fortune, really, to go see the, um, the site where it's going to be built in South Africa when we were building our project. It's going to have thousands and thousands of dishes. Uh, they're going to have they're uh, going to have to correlate or combine the data from all these dishes into a single data set. Um, they may have to actually crowdsource the computing problem. The way I, I don't know how many of you guys ever did or still do SETI at home uh, or those kind of projects where it runs the data in the background on your screensaver. They might have to do that just to get the data out, and then they have the data that has to be analyzed. Uh, and there's going to be you know, opportunities for citizen science in there. So we're, we're drowning in data, basically. Um, so we want uh, to engage people just because it's, it's practical. But there's another reason why we do citizen science and why we reach out and build citizen science projects. And one of my, um, my big, um, uh, I guess, motivations or inspirations in both astronomy and in skepticism was Carl Sagan. Uh, I, saw, I saw the movie Contact. I was fairly young, and, and uh, so I, I hadn't read any of his books. I didn't know who he was. I saw the movie. He obviously just passed away. Um, and I saw this movie, and Ellie Arroway was a radio astronomer. And I thought, I could be one, too. And I actually became one, which is totally weird. Um, <laughs> but then later, I was in grad school. I really it was actually weird. Uh, I thought I'd be an astronomer, and I went in another direction. And then by accident, I ended up in radio astronomy. So it was pretty cool. Uh, but uh, reading Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World in grad school, I was dog sitting for one of my professors at University of Virginia. And one of the perks of being his dog sitter was you had the entire library open to you. So I helped him to pick up this book. Um, and, and it really spoke to me about using scientific skepticism in, in many facets of life. Um, so the connection with citizen science here is I don't just want to do citizen science. We don't just want to do citizen science because, yes, we need the help. But there's a broader educational purpose. Um, and, and I really do truly believe that in order to foster a broader scientific understanding, people need to see a little bit of how it works. Even if it's just a little bit, even if it's just one step of the analysis, or just talking to the scientist, or hearing something about it, knowing a scientist, um, there's, there's something about taking it down from the ivory tower and making it real and tangible. And, and I may be preaching to the choir here at Skepticon, and, but uh, um, there's, a, there's a broader population of people out there that I want to see, and I want them to see the process and communicate with scientists. Um, and the more that they understand scientists as humans and, and see the scientific process as a human endeavor, I think the more acceptance of science that we're going to get. So I really think that that part of science education is important. Um, so one way of getting people to see that is to engage them in a citizen science project. Like, this is how the data is collected. This is how it's analyzed. We are talking, to, we are using your data and feeding that in and, and getting our results out. Um, and of course, my favorite quote of Sagan's from that book in particular, um, I will read this all. Uh, We've arranged a global civilization in which the most crucial elements profoundly depend on science and technology. We have also arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. I don't know if you guys saw me fiddling with that projector earlier. <laughs> That's an example. Um, this is a prescription for disaster. We might get away with it for a while, but sooner or later, this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. Um, Sagan feared that it was literally going to blow up in our faces uh, in some kind of nuclear war. Uh, he was also um, a proponent of looking at global warming, the thing we now have you know, given a slightly different name of climate change. Um, realizing that science and technology are intertwined so deeply in our lives and not understanding how it works well enough just to be able to vote on it 
is really dangerous. And so I'm a proponent of science education, not just to make more scientists, but to make everybody a little bit of a scientist so that we have scientific literacy throughout the population and people can start making those informed decisions. So, ooh. Thank you. So, um, like I said, I, I, I may be preaching to the choir, but sometimes the choir needs a little bit of a pep, you know. Um, and, and not everybody here is a scientist by a trade, so I'm inviting you guys to get your hands dirty. You may literally get your hands dirty <laughs> in that way. Uh, you may go out and collect microbes or photograph ladybugs or collect rain and hail and, and all kinds of data. You might come on our website and, and mark craters. You're not literally playing in moon dust, unfortunately. Um, but you can do science with us and you can get your hands dirty. You get your hands dirty in the data and you can actually be a part of that process. So I invite you to do that and then I invite you to bring a friend. Bring a friend along who may not share your passion for science and show them this cool thing. Find something that aligns with their interest and say, hey, check out how this works. This is science happening right here, right now. This is us collecting data and being a part of that process. I think if each one of us um, can do that, get involved in research just a little bit, find out what science is going on and, and why we need your, your contribution. And together, doing all that, I think we can make a more scientific world. Thank you. And yes, hi. Do we want to do questions or? I, 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 we have maybe time for one question. Okay. <laughs> no pressure. We have time for just one question. I see. I see a hand silhouetted against the light. There. Sure, so the question is, um, are there concerns within the scientific community that you have people who are not necessarily trained in science collecting a lot of your data? You're absolutely right, that is a concern. And so we have to go through a certain amount of error checking afterwards. Um, with the, the crater results in particular, it took several passes through the reviewers for them to like really be okay with it, in, in our case. Um, and so our, our PI Stewart just did a lot of really rigorous statistics to be able to show like, no, look, seriously, look at this. We haven't thrown anything out. This matches this. Uh, and was able to show statistically that it was significant. So you have to go through that and it's good, right? It's good that the reviewers are skeptical. They're saying, hey, you're throwing a whole bunch of people at it. Um, but to be honest, there's nothing, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you this. There's nothing that special. I mean, yes, you get trained in some way as a scientist, but it's not that, some of these tasks, a lot of these tasks are not that special. It's really just getting yourself in a place where you're doing something and doing it accurately and thinking about it. Um, and with our, you know, our, our little tutorials, and people get trained very quickly to do this task really well. Um, so we have the statistics to show that um, the people do just as well, and that's how it got published.